There is certainly a lot of hostility at the moment online at the moment. I've noticed a fair bit of it, Julian. Are you seeing any of it on the ground at all? No, we're seeing almost none of it on the ground. I mean, I think there's a bit of a hot house on social media, but when you actually get out in community, uh, people are very positive about, uh, about this issue. The constitutional recognition has been a long time coming. It's been a dream of people since the 1930s. This change completes our constitution and it recognises Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but it also provides us for a practical means of helping to close the gap and address some of those uh, terrible statistics that we know where an Aboriginal person's life expectancy is eight years lower than the rest of our population, where an Aboriginal person is two and a half times more likely to die by sure. suicide than the rest of the population, where one and two Aboriginal people live at or below the poverty line. This is a situation that can't continue. And this referendum gives us an opportunity to achieve structural change to address that. And that's what's exciting people. That's what's motivating people to come out this morning uh, and uh, get involved in this campaign okay. and to vote yes. Julian, t uh, t Tony Abbott wrote yesterday in the Sydney Morning Herald that it's hard to imagine, and this is just part of it, it's hard to imagine how a voice could add to the advice already coming from a plethora of existing consultation mechanisms. The voice would just be more of the same, especially more money. And I have to say, I've heard that a bit too. It's a common reaction from folks. And it's true, is it not? No, what makes the voice different is the voice is actually chosen by Aboriginal people in the local and regional communities and it feeds into the national, uh, into the national scene through, uh, through its place in the Constitution. Uh, and what is important about it is because it's in the Constitution, it'll have a different status to many of those other bodies. My right. experience, uh, my long experience in this policy space as Chair of the House Indigenous Affairs Committee, as somebody who's been an advocate for this for over 10 years and has worked in Indigenous policy, is that too often we actually fail to listen to Indigenous people on the ground. Too often we fail to ensure that smart ideas that are dreamt up in Canberra actually are ground-truthed. Uh, in community, and that's what this is about fundamentally. OK, well, I mean, just for an argument here. So the National Indigenous Australians Agency, its mission is to ensure Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lives are heard, recognised and empowered. That sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Well, the National Indigenous Australians Agency is just a rebranded old Commonwealth Department of Aboriginal Affairs. That's all it is. Right. Where it's so full of good go? public servants, What's but in many respects, it's the problem. What's the point of it, then, if we have problem. a voice? So the, well, it, it, its job is to deliver the programs and the funding. The Voice's job isn't to deliver programs and funding, it's to provide advice. It's to check that when the National Indigenous Agency is coming up with a policy idea, that it actually has some chance of working on the ground, because the National Indigenous Ag Australians Agency is an agency based in Canberra. It's based in some regional parts, but it doesn't get into community. The benefit of The Voice is it is connected with the local and regional bodies on the ground that will provide advice to the public service, to the ministers and to the parliament, and that should help us close the gap. OK. Well, Julie and Lisa, as always, appreciate your time. Thank you so much.